Okay, uh, uh, welcome everybody and uh, thanks uh, to another talk in the Tartan uh, Slam series. Today, I uh, wanted to have uh, Ali Aga. He is a principal uh, investigator and research uh, technologist at JPL and the uh, Caltech Center, Center for Autonomous Systems and Technologies. Uh, his research is on autonomy for robotic system and spacecraft uh, with a dual focus on planetary exploration and terrestrial application. Uh, Dr. Aga led uh, Team Costa uh, and uh, development of Nebula for the DARPA sub T challenge. Um, and uh, before that, he was uh, with Qualcomm Research, uh, leading the perception efforts for self flying drone and autonomous cars. And before that, was a postdoc at MIT. And uh, his research interests are in uh, artificial intelligence, autonomous decision making, and perception for robotic systems, and applications to drones, rovers, and legged robots. And uh, Dr. Aga was a NASA NIC fellow in 2018. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, uncertainty in robotic autonomous systems. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for the kind introduction and thank you so much for, for the invitation to this amazing uh, seminar series at, at CMU. Um, let me uh, I see, uh, share my screen here. Uh, okay, great. Can you let me know maybe if you see the right side of the screen? Uh, yep. The one without notes. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, as as Basti mentioned, um, you know, I, I I'm currently at JPL. I have two roles at JPL on the management track. I am the uh, oh, I to okay on the management track. I'm the group leader for aerial mobility group at JPL, that is uh, responsible for many of the aerial mobility related projects at at JPL, including Mars helicopter. Uh, which is led by Teddy Zenatus. And as you might know, just 10 days ago, Mars Heli completed uh, the flight number 16. So it's pretty exciting times uh, uh, in general for aerial mobility people at, at JPL. Um, in my second role on the technology track and PI track, I'm uh, working with uh, the team Nebula team, where we develop um, autonomy algorithms. Uh, for various robotic systems, ground and aerial and, and underground systems. And that's going to be mostly the focus of my talk today. Uh, and I know this is talked on SLAM series, but my talk is not going to be necessarily focused on SLAM, although it's going to have some relationship and relations to, to SLAM and, and localization uncertainty uh, in, in the planning algorithms that we, I'm going to talk about. Okay, so I'll, I'll start maybe with a very brief uh, kind of overview of uh, um, some of the projects that I've been PI for in the last several years and Nebula team have been working on. Uh, to just give you some, uh, you know, um, impressions of, of some of, of, of these major projects. On uh, top left, you see our efforts towards uh, developing algorithms for autonomous coordination of, of Mars Heli and, and uh, Mars Rover in, on the research side and, and prototype uh, platforms. Top right is our um, uh, deployment of um, multi-legged robot system in to explore Mars-like uh, caves. Um, uh, bottom left is our uh, participation in the subterranean challenge. Uh, and the bottom right is the racer project, a project we just started a couple months ago for high-speed um, self-driving cars. That video is not ours, uh, of course, that's, that's the dream. I'll, I'll talk more about it at the end of the, today's talk, uh, but the other videos are, are from the team and I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into some of these projects throughout the, the slides. Okay. Um, <clears throat> more than 100 people in the last several years have contributed to these projects and, and uh, Nebula framework and, and basically the results I'm gonna uh, present today. And these people really, you know, where they fit at JPL is kind of we are these two guys in the, in the middle of this bridge. Uh, our, you know, um, main objective and goal is what you see in the right. Um, 
which is our main goal is basically to develop methods and do enough of engineering that we can deploy the solutions in the field and deploy it frequently under challenging and, and extreme conditions. Um, but to be able to do that, in many cases, we basically uh, gain that the, we get the insight from the field, go back to the fundamental theory and try to relax some of the assumptions there uh, to basically make the theory more general or more applicable to uh, to the, the field deployment we are we are facing with the, to be going be able to go from nominal conditions to to the field. So basically, this back and forth between these two is is uh, really a lot of um, the effort uh, the, from the Nebula team to be able to adjust the theories and and go and deploy it in the field so that we with the minimal engineering we have a resilient system. And there are many different ways to bridge this gap. This is a multi-dimensional, of course, gap and many different ways to create this resiliency. Uh, so in this talk, I'm gonna just focus on one specific uh, you know, perspective where you try to increase resiliency of the system by treating the uncertainty uh, you know, better or, or basically focusing on, on modeling, learning the uncertainty to better quantify risk and, and you know, outcomes of the system and uh, react to these uncertainties. And even more importantly, try to figure out and find solutions that helps you to steer and control the uncertainty of the system uh, so that you basically can control the outcome of the system and hence be more resilient to, to unexpected things. Uh, so our efforts, we have been trying to package it in, uh, in a framework called Nebula, uh, and, and uh, this is a modular system based on ROS, so that you know, as we introduce uh, new modules, the, the system becomes uh, you know, more and more capable in handling different types of uncertainty in the system. Uh, these include uh, the ones that you see here, uncertainty in the system measurements, environment, command, uh, and system health, and, and so on. And on top of that, we have been trying to also study the relationship between these different state domains and interaction between these uncertainties to see if there are ways to efficiently basically leverage these relationships and gather information about certain parts of the state to help uh, with controlling the, the uncertainty in the other parts of the state. Oh, as we move forward, I'll give some more, uh, a, a bit more concrete examples on, on, on these uh, topics. But with that intro, uh, basically here is kind of the outline of the talk. I'll start with um, um, a few reference missions to give you some context and impressions on what type of robots we're working with, what type of deployments uh, you know, we, are, we are dealing with. Um, in part two, I'll discuss a little bit about the, the core principles um, uh, behind you know, the design of Nebula. And, and at the end, I will go and give some uh, concrete examples of, of, of the algorithms um, coming from those core principles. OK. I did talk about the Bray project, uh, which is uh, focused on deploying multiple legged robots to explore Mars-like caves. Um, you see here the, the video from um, deployment of the legged platforms in uh, Lava Beds National Monument. Uh, where the robot is tasked to uh, find targets like the ones that you see at the bottom left, where we have neural networks trained over these sorts of targets, and the robot needs to handle a lot of uncertainty in terms of traversability, perception, uh, state of the mission, and so on, so that autonomy can go hundreds of meters in these um, narrow and challenging caves to be able to uh, detect these um, uh, and find these uh, science targets and come back and report them to the, to the operator. The second uh, example, which I'm sure many of you are pretty familiar with, is our efforts towards DARPA Subterranean Challenge, which is a project our team has been focusing on for the last three and four years almost, uh, where um, it's uh, in the format of prize competitions, and they're like one competition per year since 2019. And the objective is to autonomously explore unknown underground environments. Uh, it's a very ch challenging problem where the system needs to explore uh, long and complex underground environments with no prior map. And there's only one single human outside the course that can see the data coming from robots only if and only when the communication is established. 
And uh, the, the most difficult of all is you have just one hour, a single run to, to you know, deploy the system and, and basically um, and, and uh, participate in this competition, that, which means you need very high levels of resiliency in the system. Uh, in terms of the scoring uh, in this competition, the, the, basically there are 20 objects distributed by the sponsor that the robots need to, um, you know, find. Uh, you get one point per artifact if the robot can classify it correctly, get to the object, locate it in, in, inside a map that the robot creates with less than five meter error. And somehow within that one hour mission time limit, report it to the service. Our concept of operation uh, and, and robot deployment has been based on deploying uh, multiple heterogeneous robotic platforms. Heterogeneous both in the sense of computation uh, on the robots, sensing sensors on them and, and locomotion capabilities. And these robots try to basically create a wireless comm communication network uh, by dropping these blue dots, as you see, uh, closer to the entrance of the course. And as they go further in, uh, these red dots, which are robots, basically leave the communication range and, and basically they come back to communication range when they collect enough data or when there are certain conditions are triggered. Uh, here are a short um, kind of um, a, a summary, I would say, of, of the robots that we have deployed in this uh, competition in the last three or four years that range from legged to wheel to to, to flying platforms. And uh, this is a five minute uh, kind of um, summary of uh, um, the deployments in the course to give you some impressions of uh, how the course looks like, how the, our robot looks like, uh, mostly for people who are not maybe as familiar with the top subterranean challenge to put a little bit uh, the rest of the talk in the context of, of uh, why we develop the kind of algorithms we develop. So what you see here is a staging area where, where the team deploys the robot. Then when they enter, robots enter the course, there's no communication with robots except that one human supervisor that can see the, the, the view that you just saw. The, while there is communication exists uh, with the human supervisor. As you see, uh, when the robots enter, the, 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 the subsequent robots follow uh, the, them to daisy chain and create a, a mesh network closer to the entrance of the course. And as they explore the environment, they create a, a 3D map of the environment. They do so in a, in a multi-robot fashion. So you see here jumps in, the, in this map. Uh, these are where the uh, these are the points that robots come to the rendezvous points. They meet each other, shared map, or send the map to the base station, and the maps are getting aligned. This happens also in multi-level. You saw there uh, the two-level map where uh, using you know legged platforms, you can go up and down the stairs and try to merge the maps from from different levels to create a, a consistent map. From traversability perspective, also this is a pretty challenging environment. Here is a clip from our test in Arch Mine, 900 feet underground in a coal mine uh, that is, uh, you know, traversability wise, there are very narrow passages for the robot that robots needs to create a detailed mesh of the surface and figure out where it can traverse, where it cannot. And for example, when a real uh, system is not able to traverse certain parts of the course, such as the stairs or high ramp, a track robot or a legged platforms. Uh, come for help and try to handle and negotiate those types of obstacles to be able to uh, maximize the coverage of, of the environment. In the backbone, we are creating a graph called IRM, Information Roadmap. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in, in the rest of the talk that basically captures the connectivity of this space and also captures how much uncertainty we have about different parts of the course, how much we have learned. And that helps us to do these sorts of maneuvers go search at certain dents uh, or certain different rooms in the environment to make sure we minimize the uncertainty in different parts of the course and maximize our chances of finding the objects and artifacts that are distributed in the course. Um, I'll skip some of the video here. Um, um, the view you see here is uh, highlights our kind of machine learning backbone. In the right, you see uh, basically our um, semantic understanding module 
that detects different artifacts in the course. That is basically our way of, of uh, getting these artifacts and get it sent it to DARPA for course scoring. Um, this is our uh, communication node deployment system that, as I mentioned, closer to the entrance of the course, it tries to create this wireless mesh network uh, to be able to talk to the surface so that the robust doesn't have to come back all the way to the surface, but rather just come back to the frontiers of the, the mesh network to, to minimize um, the time and if increase the efficiency of the system. Sometimes the robots are out of the communication range for a while. And when they come back, they basically dump the, the full data and, and, and the map that they have created in the course uh, when they were out of the communication range and were exploring autonomously. Sometimes a robot gets a stock or uh, there are uh, uh, basically, you need to basically send faster uh, systems like drones to go grab the data and bring it back to the surface. Um, so here you see a clip uh, from one of our practice runs in, in West Virginia, when the drone in the coal mine tries to basically search the environment and then grab data from, from ground robot and, and, and come back to the surface. And here is our uh, one of our uh, platforms we call a drone helicopter, a drone that ro rolls on the ground and fly when needed. This was one of the early concepts we have been working on in this challenge to extend the, 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 the life and span or operation time of, of the drone. But I'll, I'll pause here, uh, but this is kind of in high level, I hope it gives you high level impressions of the, the, the types of robots we have been deploying in this, um, in this competition and type of environment and challenges uh, the system has been facing um, in exploring these underground uh, terrains. In terms of numbers, our, our best results uh, on, on this front can kind of be summarized on this slide here, um, where uh, per robot, uh, basically a single robot, have been were able to explore more than two kilometers, traverse more than two kilometers in about one hour, and, and map more than four, four kilometers of the course. In our best runs, we, uh, in, I guess it was August of 2021 that we were uh, finally able to actually deploy 11 robots simultaneously in, in our um, practice runs in Lexington, uh, uh, Kentucky, in, in, a, in a kind of a limestone mine. Um, 11 robots composition was like four-legged robots, four-wheeled and three drones. Uh, and overall, we have been, um, um, on average, deploying four to five robots in our practice rounds, and in the competition, uh, we we deployed similar numbers, five to six robots. Uh, uh, just to give you some impressions of the complexity of the system and uh, the resiliency, it would need to be able to um, consistently operate uh, in, in in these sorts of environments. Okay. Uh, so, with this context on on the type of missions. Uh, uh, that we have been focusing on. In part two, I will go a little bit uh, deeper into, into Nebula framework, the, the autonomy solutions that we have been developing in the background to uh, and, and implementing on these different robots to enable their, their autonomous behaviors. And I'll discuss a little bit about the, the core principles uh, behind this and how we try to increase the resiliency of the solution by embedding and, and treating uncertainty uh, in, in this framework. Uh, the block diagram you see here is, is a simplified block diagram of, of the nebula. It's uh, part, many parts of it is pretty standard. At the top, you see the robots getting actions and sensors that uh, you know, collect the measurements. Measurements go into the, the perception module here um, on the right, the green area. Uh, and the data from perception gets uh, shared and summarized and gets shared with the planning module. But okay, uh, so yeah, measurements come to the perception module highlighted in green. It's shared with the planning module in orange uh, and the blue parts are the communication system, hardware and software that enables talking across different agents and, and you know, basis station. Uh, but the main reason I have this block diagram here is really this purple and, and red regions. That is kind of nebula way to to you know push and treat uncertainty in the, in this uh, system. So the purple is the representation that is uh, created by different modules, both planning and perception, and shared between different modules. 
And the red, the most important piece of, of nebula is basically a module that tries to get this representation, which we call leaf, which is probability distribution over the state of the system, and tries to predict that uh, into the future. And uh, hence try to predict the outcomes and, and even better try to see if it can control the outcome and then increase the resilience of the system. So to enable something like this, we really the representation part is really critical. You need to have a representation that is can be predicted or, or evolved in a computationally tractable manner. So uh, in, in summary, basically to gain resilience, an a way of thinking is to try to predict behaviors and outcome and uh, try to see if it's possible to control uncertainty and, and minimize that risk. So those behaviors, you can think of behavior being behavior of individual modules in a classical autonomy framework where you have modules like localization, mapping, planning, and, and so on. And you can get the state of each module and, and predict. But what we have learned uh, over a lot of field deployments uh, that is that if, if you can model and formulate a problem on these edges, rather than looking at state domain in each module, look at the joint state, or better put, joint probability distribution across the states of the, the neighboring modules, it increased the uh, resiliency of the system significantly. Um, so to, to put this in a maybe more concrete example, um, yeah, so, okay. So I was just saying that basically, here's an, a concrete example of that kind of perspective. Um, and, you know, I, in, in robotics community, it's very well-known concept that solving the problem of localization where the robot is and solving the problem of mapping the environment looks like and putting them together, a disjoint integration of them is not equal to solving a slam, simultaneous localization mapping, which is, you know, closer to the optimal, more resilient. Um, so basically, in, in, in short, this is what Nebula is trying to do. It's trying to see, can we treat planning and perception in a similar perspective, right? Can we formulate this slap problem, simultaneous localization planning, and look at the joint distribution across controls and the state of this robot, or controls and the map, and uh, do SMAP, simultaneous mapping and planning. And, um, and, and basically this is how it tries to live, live on the edges rather than look at the specific state domains. And if you can do so, basically um, what emerges is on top of planning based on perception, we are able to planning uh, for perception and try to see if you can steer the, the, the sensory input to the, to the system to better predict and control the uncertainty and hence increase the resiliency of, 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 the, of the operations. Okay, so with that view, uh, basically I'll, uh, in part three and four, go a little bit deeper into more concrete examples of, of, uh, of some of these edges. I'll, I'll start with, with the slab and I'll be a little bit faster given the time we lost on the, on the screen sharing here. Um, but for, for simultaneous localization planning, let's just start with this simple example that uh, you have a, a system uh, with dynamics F, um, with the noise, motion noise W, its state is measured by certain sensors, contaminated by noise, and there's this estimator that generates the belief or information state, which is nothing but the probability distribution over the state of system given the past data. It's your traditional filter, like your common filter, particle filter, or uh, filter of choice that you like to work with. And then your, your controller planner is a, a, a mapping that maps this information state or belief to the, to the actions. Um, so in, in Nebula, we are trying to see, is it possible that we basically uh, forget about system and look at the belief dynamics? Because any system you can have this kind of, try to see if you can have this recursive belief evolution and look at this belief dynamics as just a dynamical system and try to directly control that. And really uh, the, the observation plays a, a similar role to the, the, the noise in dynamics where it's a, it's a control, uh, it's a noise that it depends on control, but it basically injects perturbation into your, your dynamics. And if, if you can control the belief directly, then basically we are, uh, it, what happens is you can 
treat the uncertainty proactively in the system. But to do so, really, there are like four um, elements to be handled in, in the process. Number one is we need to converge on representation. How do you represent the uncertainty in the system? What is the, the, the tractable way of uh, encoding the belief? How it's going to evolve? Um, in its very general form, it's evolved by a focal plant cosmograph of PDE in a linear Gaussian setup, simple setup, it's a Riccati. So where do you fall in that spectrum uh, that suits the, the application domain, but also computationally aligned with the amount of compute you have on the robots? Then once you have that evolution, there's a, typically a cost of taking action at leaf B that some of these costs, given the actions taken under policy pi, is your cost to go or value function that captures how good a given policy is. And the planner is solving the planning problem is basically finding the best policy that minimizes its cost to go. In computer science community, this is uh, also called uh, sometimes PomDP problem uh, or partially observed Markov decision process. And it's, uh, it's in its most general form, it's computationally intractable. So really uh, the, the research goes into how to do these steps so that for particular problem, you are able to inject as much uncertainty as possible and treat that in a best way to increase the resiliency of the system. And here's one super simple example of a toy example in this slap case. Let's say you have a robot trying to go from start to goal and you don't want to hit the obstacles. You simplify the environment with this graph uh, and try to limit the search space. And say, let's say you start with a, a Gaussian distribution with mean and covariance at the start node. And in the belief space, this whole distribution is a single point in the high dimensional space. You take actions and get observations along these edges as you know, uh, as you kind of imagining the robot move forward. And, and the belief evolves. Um, as you basically try to do this planning in, in the robot's kind of head uh, forward, uh, uh, you're basically creating a tree in the belief space, tree of options, how the belief and uncertainty is gonna evolve. And uh, what that means is to evaluate the risk and cost, uh, or in other words, maybe, uh, one indicator of resilience of the system along this edge, you need to really look at four different edges or exponential number of, of, of edges. Um, uh, and, and that very soon gets computationally intractable because of that exponential growth of the tree. Um, so we have been working on a framework called Information Roadmap or FIRM, uh, where um, uh, we have been studying that certain conditions and cases under which uh, you can design uh, certain closed loop controllers and bring borrow some uh, theory from the control theory uh, that helps you to push the uncertainty and the belief towards a predefined uncertainty of, of the localization at certain parts of the space. Um, uh, this is, uh, of course, not true for all the system, but if you have a nonlinear system, that is locally well linearizable, uh, which is true for some of the robotic systems. Uh, these sorts of controllers uh, can, can be designed. Um, and what really metaphorically means compared in relationship to the previous tree that I showed in the previous slide, you're basically creating these sorts of funnels that gets different type uh, localization uncertainties and tries to look at uh, landmarks and look at the information about the, the map and the, the world in a certain way to, to funnel that into a particular distribution. And this way helps you to create a graph in the belief space rather than a tree. And of course, in, in this case, what if you have a graph, then to evaluate the cost on this edge, you're evaluating one cost, one edge. And hence it grows linearly and you can go much further into the planning horizon compared to a structure grows exponentially. Um, while this gives you this longer horizon risk predictability, it, you're really trading off uh, the, the optimality. You're, you're gaining more predictability, but because you're adding this additional structure uh, and basically killing some of these 
potential trajectories for for belief that might have been the most you know optimal. Uh, so you're you're basically losing optimality a little bit there. That's why we typically treat this kind of as an upper bound to help the system in the long term to not fall into local minima. And in short horizon, we try to do a traditional PomDP framework. And this may be um, evolution further highlights uh, what I mean there. So you have this robot going from left to right. And as you see, as it moves, it basically does not commit to these firm nodes. Uh, it, uh, it basically deviates from those and does not complete those funnels because there's no risk around it. So it can tolerate the uncertainty, but it understands when it gets to this point, because it has to go through these more risky areas, it actually autonomously understands now is the time for me to really complete my full funnel and make sure that um, the uncertainty gets to a certain shape that I can go through this narrow passage and risky area and interaction between my localization uncertainty and, and obstacles is in a way that I can survive. It does that, it, it does continue doing that. And then as it again leaves the risk area, it, it relaxes on, on committing to the firm nodes and, and uses just as an upper bond for longer horizon planning. So this is kind of the regime we have been, been, been using these sorts of information roadmaps in, in our framework and have been applying it to, to various uh, physical systems, um, you know, from rovers to drones and very low cost, uh, you know, platforms, a lot of uncertainty that has, you know, the, the, the best show actually the impact of these sorts of methods. Um, but again, to remind everybody, this is a slap, meaning that there is some idea of the map a priori uh, and some idea of how the information is distributed and then uh, in the environment to, to use them in localization. That typically comes from a prior first robot, right? Here, a Mars helicopter, a prototype helicopter provides some information for rover, or here, you know, a, a first drone or first legged robot provides some idea of the terrain, and then the next robot uh, carry out the mission in a faster, more efficient way and, and more resilient way. So, now, what do we do? What about the cases that we don't have the map of the environment? Uh, what can we do in those cases? So I'll, I'll again, give a very um, um, kind of simple toy example here um, to, to highlight some of the ideas on uh, SMAP side. Um, so let's say we have a drone um, going from this start task to go from start to the goal. We know the blue areas are obstacle, yellow is unknown. And the goal is to, you know, get to the goal, but by minimizing time and not colliding with the obstacles. Uh, one can take a, a long safe path that drone goes, turns, looks very carefully. So the green area is kind of, you can imagine the, the frost for the field of view. It turns, watches and, and looks at the, the risk area and, and then uh, decides to move forward or take a different path given the information it collects. Or we can take a very short but risky path. The drone goes, it even doesn't turn or, or watch. It just assumes the best about the environment and it's going to be free and it just goes sideways towards the goal. Um, and of course, there could be different realizations of the environment, right? The environment might be, you know, this surprise region here might have been blocked, which is really bad for one of those two methods, or it might have been open, which is efficient for the one that doesn't look really. And the probability that this realization switches or your understanding of this switches is something we call surprise. Um, that basically kind of governs the, the, the chance of replanning, right? If you think it's like this, you move forward, you think it changed to this. So that's when you replan. And we would like to minimize that to increase the mission speed, uh, typically. Um, so uh, we put this similar problem in front of a, a world champion FPV um, drone, drone pilot, and this is the sort of behavior the human pilot does, right? It's really interesting. Initially, a little bit counterintuitive, it gets farther from, the, from that area, but as it, it maintains the, 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 the person, uh, the human supervisor, um, the operator, maintains high speed while it's actually turning the uh, the, the drone so that he can see through FPV what's going to be here. And by the time he's almost here, he knows if it is blocked or not. If it is not blocked, 
he has maintained high speed, it goes forward. If it's blocked, it can detour and take a trajectory maybe from top. And uh, the, the real question is now, how can we do this autonomously? What's the, the optimal speed here? What's the shape and, and kind of curvature of, of, of this trajectory so that we gain the most information about the map um, uh, 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 and, and do behavior similar to what uh, this human uh, pilot does. And really to be able to do that, um, the key is to somehow be able to predict how the information about this yellow region or surprise region is gonna evolve, how the belief is gonna evolve in, in along the trajectory. And, and, and maybe the most important insight is this, that when the human pilot was at the starting point, before he basically take the uh, drive the, the, the drone, when he commits to these sorts of trajectory, he does not know, he didn't know if there would be an obstacle or, or this is gonna be free. So he did not know about the first moment or mean value of, of the information, but he already knew when he was committing to this trajectory about the second moment of the information. Even before following this trajectory, he knew what the variance about this information is gonna be. Is it gonna be small or large? So he knew how much confident it's gonna be on the information that he doesn't know what it is. So he doesn't know the mean, but he knows the, the variance. And that insight is what we are trying to, you know, carry to the, to the autonomy development. So we looked at um, some of the traditional grid mapping methods and look at how the uncertainty or variance evolution uh, works in those grid-based mapping methods. And it, it's a well-known concept that their variance prediction is, is inconsistent. And this is mostly because they have been optimized for first moment estimation, for most likely estimation of occupancy in, in, a, in a grid map. Um, so we have been working on, on, on a framework, uh, we, we call it a confidence-rich map, that basically tries to capture a, a full probability distribution at each grid cell uh, that has higher order moments, second moment, third moment of the probability distribution at each grid cell to, to help us basically to have a more consistent variance prediction. By consistent meaning that compute, computed variance, computational variance is, um, is in harmony with the statistical distribution of the true error uh, of, of, um, of, 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 uh, of that cell, occupancy in that cell. So, so now that if, if you have a map that captures the variance well, now you can go back and, and help, uh, basically do uh, a sort of um, maneuvers that uh, see if you can do sort of maneuvers that the human pilot uh, was doing. So we, before doing that, we tried uh, uh, different data sets to make sure the, the, um, the inconsistency or consistency measure across different data set uh, it still shows that um, uh, the, the method improves the consistency of the variance. And uh, we, we realized that in addition to improving consistency, also on the first moment, the method helped us to uh, reduce the, uh, the map error uh, compared to the, the, the state of the art uh, in, in the grid mapping. Um, so putting the CRM within the planning framework um, basically helps us to uh, predict the, the map leaf um, and, and help us to, uh, to control the uncertainty by selecting a, a trajectory that leads to an uncertainty that we prefer. Um, so to do so, basically the first step was to, to bring this map um, uncertainty M here into a, an equation that computes the traversability chance along a given trajectory defined by X here. Um, so once you have some notion of the traversability assessment along a trajectory, given that uncertain map evolution into future, now here is really the, the uh, creating the risk um, equation is, is, uh, is the one that helps us to enable source of maneuvers similar to uh, the human pilot where um, you're bringing in to the equation the expected value of the traversability, which of course you wanna go through a traversable uh, part of the terrain, but also you are able to now bring in the variance of the traversability. 
And this is basically nothing but that an, a, a, another way of representing the surprise, right? It's the variance of how much your understanding of traversability might change. And it's an indicator of how much replanning you might need, right? And that uh, doing so, um, basically, um, you can show that on, on some of the examples, uh, generic examples we have been working on, the, the number of replanning steps can go down up to 70%. And overall, because you're now not stopping and replanning or thinking again, overall, the, the mission speed uh, increases by uh, somewhere between 30 to 40% and helps you to, to kind of do these sorts of maneuvers that collects information actively before you face with a, with a surprise to, to you know, um, to, to break. Okay. I'm uh, running out of time, so I'll be a little bit faster. So we have um, applied these sorts of SMAP type uh, frameworks on, on drones, legged platforms, and recently we are trying to um, um, uh, study uh, apl application of these sorts of slap, SMAP uh, frameworks on off-road um, self-driving cars, which I uh, mentioned earlier in the call. Uh, for the racer project that we are just starting. It's a pretty exciting project um, uh, where, um, again, the goal is to go over uh, no road terrains, over rocks, vegetation, and all that in, in high speeds. And, and we are trying to um, basically study how the, these uncertainties can be embedded in geometry, not just geometry, but also semantics of the environment in model-based settings, similar to SMAP frameworks that I talked about, but also in cases that it's really harder to model, how can we uh, you know, use ML or deep RL to, to help uh, get some help from the ML community to, um, to uh, help it with managing this uncertainty in a, in a more efficient, uh, efficient, uh, efficient way. Um, um, this is going to be, you know, a big focus of, of my team moving forward in the next few years. So, of course, we are we are also hiring uh, on this project uh, for the next uh, few years um, and uh, uh, trying to see some of these uh, how some of these nebula frameworks, both on on mapping uncertainty, localization uncertainty, health of the system. Uh, and so on can be translated to adjusting the speed of the system and then risk of the system. It also has interesting connection to the space applications. Of course, we are not going <laughs> to jump like this on, on Mars or Moon, but LTV, lunar transport vehicle um, that are designed to carry astronauts are, um, of course, there are no roads on, on Moon or Mars. They need to deal with off-road uh, traversability of passenger sized vehicles. A lot of these framework, uh, these sorts of technologies, hopefully, will be translated to to space applications and uh, uh, in in future. Okay, so with that, I'll I'll uh, wrap up the talk. Uh, I did talk about this this framework of, of going from resiliency to predictive behaviors and trying to stay on on these basically edges uh, the, between the modules rather than each module to to increase the resiliency. Uh, but really, we are scratching the surface here. There are so many modules, and this is a very underexplored area. Um, here are some of our papers that try to look at some of other edges, you know, looking at how to incorporate communication uncertainty, maybe some navigation uncertainty, but um, there's, um, you know, a ton of un 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 uh, not explored areas and, and topics on these uh, domains that uh, we uh, overall as a community, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity to to study these and increase the resiliency of the system for for different sectors for space industrial uh, applications and, and everyday life um, of course and um, to to basically conclude uh, you know there are many different ways to increase the resilience and enable consistent deployment of robotic systems in the field uh, in this talk i uh, looked at it from a, a one specific perspective of, of treating uncertainty um, and, and try to control the uncertainty and as a, uh, as a result, try to see if we can predict the risk and control the risk. And um, to do so, the algorithmic tools that um, we have been using in my team uh, are mostly focused on co-designing inference and planning, 
try to model uncertainty using model-based methods or uh, you know ML-based data-driven methods and uh, uh, leverage uh, MDP and PUMDP type frameworks and you know extend them to continuous state action and observation domains using control uh, theory methods to be able to um, uh, handle the computational intractability of uh, planning under uncertainty frameworks. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for, for your attention. And I want to highlight again, this is a work of a pretty large team in the background. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Great. Th thanks, Ali, <laughs> for the, for the uh, nice talk. And then uh, uh, I'd like to open it up uh, for any questions. Also, questions from the audience, you can uh, kind of raise your hand if you're on, on Zoom. And uh, just unmute. Okay, uh, maybe while people kind of get their, um, uh, their questions together. So um, I had, uh, so I guess, uh, maybe just to kind of summarize if I understood it great. So the idea is, you know, to get resiliency, I guess your idea is to say, okay, let's uh, model this, uh, uh, you know, let's model the uncertainty, capture the uncertainty and use that for the decision-making. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, there, there are other things, other ways to get resiliency. And I think you showed some of this, essentially you have some redundancy, right? Like you have multiple systems uh, that gives you some resilience. Um, but uh, so coming to the <clears throat> uncertainty, so uh, I guess uh, for some, and I saw kind of your slides, two things. One is you had essentially a Gaussian model for a lot of things. And then you mentioned, uh, and then I think maybe in your last slide somewhere I saw like SIVA is like a different way of, of using this uncertainty. And so uh, I guess maybe the CBOR kind of represents <laughs> what a lot of what we're after is like the, the long tail of lots of things that can go wrong. Can you comment a little bit of this, like where you, what your thinking is and why you're choosing these models? And... Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're hitting a great point. I mean, model, you know, that representation is, is really a, a big part of all of this, right? How, how do you, how do you um, represent uncertainty and Sometimes, you know, um, like you said, uh, uh, Gaussian distribution, you, you get lucky, it's a good representation and then you can, you know, it's easier to handle. Sometimes it's not a good representation, but you just give up because computationally the other ones are, are difficult. And sometimes, you know, uh, we, we use non-Gaussian, for example, in this map case that the confidence rich maps I was talking about, uh, you know, the idea was um, uh, we, um, it was not Gaussian, basically. You had this polynomial distribution describing the occupancy of, of each, uh, each uh, cell with, with high order kind of moments. Um, and, but in that case, um, you basically, it turns out that you are able to create this recursive filter on this polynomial distribution. So it really goes hand in hand with the evolution as well. Uh, if, if you have a non-Gaussian distribution, if you have a nice evolution model, you can do that. And of course, in many other PUMDP methods, uh, traditional point-based, that they, they don't assume any, any uh, format and it's just a point-based um, um, uh, forward prediction of the, of the uncertainty. Um, um, so on the second part of your, your uh, comment, uh, yes, it's uh, really that, that long tail uh, that is in many cases um, is, is what we need to take care of for, for the resilience. And, you know, we have been playing a lot with different types of cost function, depending on the type of deployment in hand. So there's not a web one generic answer there, but, um, you know, depending on the type of deployment, um, you know, uh, uh, you basically can, can look at the interaction between the risk um, and, and uncertainty. If we have had in certain cases, for example, you really want to, you know, look at two different uh, modes of uncertainty. So in those cases, we model uncertainty typically with something like a particle-based representation. We capture one mode uh, in, in, you know, 
uh, for, for rare events and other modes for, for common events and try to you know bring both into the planning and you know um, look at certain risk of okay if the, the, this thing goes wrong with a low probability but very high risk and this other thing you know the, the first moment goes wrong with a high probability but less risk how to embed them into the multi-objective optimization and, and that. but but it's very much dependent on the specific deployment and a specific uh, mission you have. And then uh, just kind of following up on this. So do you, do you think, uh, I mean, let's say in the experience on the sub T challenge that um, you were able to capture the uncertainty, um, you know, during, uh, you know, use that uncertainty well and, and capture it well in the, in the models you built? Uh, yeah, so I think sub T is a, is a really interesting and, and example there we, we tried uh, a lot from different directions to, to push again with a, with a kind of similar philosophy I was talking about in the talk in some aspects we were successful in some aspects we were not meaning the uncertainty was like just too wild in terms of both modeling or, or uh, managing the ones that we were successful were um, were uh, were the, capturing the uncertainty in the map so for our coverage algorithms uh, to know that, what part of the environment we have covered more uh, or what parts we have covered less. That was a successful kind of um, um, uh, experience with the embedding uncertainty, meaning that we were able to distinguish between cases that if I see a part of the environment at a far field of part of my field of view in a bad angle once, you know, versus another part of the environment that I've seen multiple times in a better angle, you know, we were basically had a nice way of separating these two, right? So in other words, there were no zero one di difference between known and unknown. So we were going from known to unknown in an almost continuous manner. So unknown for us was just a known with a very high variance. So th that helped us a little bit to uh, smooth out kind of the planning methods because the planner were understanding, okay, this is how much information is there I embedded and I take actions that you know, increase the, the coverage uh, of, of the method. We, we also had a little bit of success in um, capturing our certainty on the traversability side uh, that uh, basically we were, tr in modeling the terrain, we had, you know, in each cell, we had some uncertainty of, of the two and a half D map, the elevation map, and basically, uh, you know, try to, uh, try to understand how we should move so that before the robot puts its leg or wheel on specific parts of the environment, you know, that uncertainty of that part has come down enough so that the risk is, is managed there. Um, and, and that's one of the places, maybe the, the main place we did use CVAR um, um, in, in, in the framework. But, but overall, uh, most of the challenge was like um, pretty, um, hard to, to capture uncertainty. For example, we had we input a lot of resources and effort to capture uncertainty about the health of the system uh, and, and the mission state, but the, the mission were pretty successful. We have had successes in the research side of it, uh, but it, it didn't reach to a level that we can deploy it in the competition. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let me see, uh, do we have any questions? I don't want to. Uh... <laughs> Lots, lots of things I'd like to ask, but uh, okay. Uh, so here's a question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. As an extension of the previous question, is it possible to quantify the uncertainty itself so as to accurately represent it? Yeah, great question. I, um, uh, uh, you know, we, it, it's, a, it's a hard one. Um, I don't think, um, I, you know, there is a very um, clear recipe to quantify, but uh, typically in, in our team, we, uh, we try to look at it from, from different angles. One is uh, you just look at the data sheet, the data comes for the sensor, the robot and all that. Number two is a statistical distribution, right? So we look at the past data and just, you know, try to over time um, model these uncertainties 
and then um, and then when we run the planner or run the other algorithms, just see if there is we feel discrepancy. Uh, and if we do feel discrepancy between our computational models and real models, we go back and try to enhance those models. Um, number three uh, is uh, we do data driven methods. We we try to just just learn. Um, in, in some of our work, we, we basically, uh, when we are not able to really, in a model base, put an uncertainty around it, we just try to uh, use um, learning methods to, to capture this. But at the very end of the day, uh, the, our perspective is, no matter what you do on the perception side uh, and our sensitive characterization side, there will be discrepancies. And that's where the planner comes, right? And that's where the kind of the two-way direction in Nebula that we are instead of just plan perception to be feeding and helping the, the, the planner, we are trying to see, is there a way, are there ways that planner can come back and help the system to collect information to reduce that uncertainty? Meaning that your, um, some of the lack of knowledge about the model of uncertainty will be compensated by just collecting a little bit more information and planning, planner replanning and coming back and, and helping the, the the, the, the filter and estimator to uh, to estimate better. And that way you kind of, you might be a little bit wrong on your estimation, but as you do this frequently re-estimation, you're kind of recovering uh, and and, uh, and uh, be, be a little bit more resilient to, to those discrepancies. Um, and uh, actually kind of just following up on this. So do you have um, any, like examples maybe from sub t where like you you did like some test without considering and with considering uh this uh, I, i'd be really interested like to see um the kind of what 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 is the impact like you know i mean it's it sounds great <laughs> and uh, i think we should do this but uh i'm i'm curious to like you know is there like a really nice example where like if I go and you had this nice example with the drone kind of, you know, taking a bigger excursion and that kind of thing, but it was like a, the PowerPoint version, right? Like, is there, uh, is there, a, um, do you have some kind of example of a, uh, Yeah, I think uh, um, the, uh, you know, one example that I mentioned was just on the map coverage, but I think you're looking for more for the examples on the, on the, on the navigation side, and on the navigation side, on the traversability, it uh, it actually th there were cases that we were not able to go through narrow passages. So, in fact, in the urban side, the urban part of, part of the competition, we have had issues with with those narrow doors, right? So, uh, and our uncertainty from a state estimation accumulates. Uh, over time and the doors get fat, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the passage is too narrow. So the system thinks that it cannot go through our Husky robots, right? But um, if, if basically you try to uh, adjust the speed uh, at, you know, slow down at certain parts or look at the, the, the door angle, a certain angle, you can, you know, make the uncertainty a little bit sharper. So that's one, one kind of concrete example that helped us to to go through some of some of these narrow passages. To um, uh, there's another really interesting example. Again, we did not deploy it, but on the research side was really great. Which was early on when we were working on the the roller copter concept that there were these drones with a shell around them that um, they were able to basically hit the hit the walls. And that were, you know, providing some mechanical resilience, right, to, to the collisions and so on. Um, there were certain scenarios that uh, it was emerging out of the, the 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 solution that the drone wanted sometimes to hit itself to the wall because it it was by by hitting to the wall it was gaining that some IMU measurement and it was kind of reducing its uncertainty that okay this is there there is a wall here or if, if I am if I'm lost you know. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that that's uh, that was more on the on the research side. Nothing that is very um, robust enough for for the the competition level, DARPA challenge level deployment in the field. Uh, but uh, but those are like some some examples. But like I said, the very best example was like really changing the the robot trajectory to best uh, increase their coverage. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so before we had uncertainty, we had certain ways of you know increasing coverage purely geometrically. But once we had uncertainty in, uh, embedded into the map, the robot at certain times, you know, we're just taking certain uh, types of maneuvers to make sure, you know, it minimizes the uncertainty about mm -hmm. the environment. And the coverage was just automatically coming out of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, that would be really interesting to see some specific examples. I'd be just really curious to, to yeah. see. <laughs> I think there was a, there's a there, there's a paper I think by by Song and Amanda called Pilgrim. Uh, I, I believe they they covered a little bit of uh, of, of that um, uncertainty driven uh, trajectory generation for for coverage there. Uh, and I think uh, another one a kind of version 2.0 of that is, is coming out. Um, Great. So forth. Great. Maybe in the sub two summit or something we'll absolutely yeah. <laughs> some more. Uh, so uh, I had another question. Sorry to hug this a little bit. Is so uh, there's like two ways roughly to use uncertainty, right? So for planning, um, so you can uh, essentially have your cost plus your uncertainty with some factor, uh, which is I think you showed in the slides, and then the other way is to say, okay, I have some acceptable level of uh, uncertainty or something like this that I and and whatever the lowest cost is is in that acceptable level. Um, so have you you know what what's your experience there? Is like do do you usually prefer combining these costs or, or um, costs? Uh, sorry, I, the very first part I, I missed a little bit. The second one I got it that the acceptable level of uncertainty. Right. So I think in one, one of the nominal. Right. So I think in one of your slides you showed. Your objective function was basically the cost plus some lambda times uncertainty or something like this mm -hmm. uh, as as your as your cost function. Is that what you typically um, go for, or is that? Yeah, let me let me go back maybe uh, kind of quickly reshare there. But um, uh, I think. Um, uh, this is the one you're referring to, right? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah so, th yeah, exactly. That's that's typically uh, really the key for us, right? Again, back to that insight I was talking about, right? So, if if you are here, so most of what we are talking about here is the robot has not moved yet. It's all planning, right? So, so the robot always is start all of these. So when you're here, it's it's almost it, it's basically impossible to know the first moments, right? So we don't know. If it's gonna be, um, uh, you know, uh, an obstacle here or not, or in the racer case, we don't know if there will be an uh, a, a rock behind the bush or a cliff behind the bush, or it's just a flat terrain, right? So really, that traversability, the the first part, if R is traversability, reflects what you know already about the environment, right? It just says, based on what I know. You know, this is how I think this is traversable. You know, um, but then really, <laughs> all, all the all, all, all of kind of that uncertainty awareness comes from the second term, right? Which says that um, again, back to that human pilot example, that human pilot doesn't know, but what he knows when he commits to these trajectories, he knows the variance of this part, how, how much the variance will be if he takes this sort of trajectory or is straight trajectory. So, so this is something even without seeing, you can, you can characterize in advance, right? Since you can characterize that, um, that, that helps basically uh, to, to know that this is how much my traversability can vary. This is variance, right? Variance of traversability. How much of a traversability? And that is an indication of how, what is the likelihood of I need to replan, right? So, um, if my traversability is going to jump, you know, it's, you know, it's maybe not good because I have to slam on brakes really hard right in front of when, when I discover that surprise. Whereas if I have some idea of replanning, uh, you know, the, which we call a surprise, then I, I take actions that minimize that surprise. And that leads to this, right? So I take things that controls this for me and take a trajectory that I have some you know, control on my future and, 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 and uh, on this kind of confidence. And as a result, um, uh, you know, 
um, I, I do less of replanning and you know more more efficient. So so yes, back to your question. Then th this is actually this is the main part, right? Of of in anything we do, uh, including this, would kind of mean um, uh, for us that we have included the uncertainty into the into the framework because just doing this is more of a reaction to uncertainty. Adding this is. This is approximate this way of stating this, but adding this is kind of, in some sense, you can say this is the proactive way of handling the uncertainty. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Adi, for agreeing uh, to the to the talk. <coughs> and then I think uh, we uh, also um, uh, we also have uh, the this Discord. I think where there's always a lot of discussion. And uh, and I think we'll also have some. Uh, if there are more questions, maybe we'll we'll follow up. <laughs> but, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. thanks so Here, much. Here is my email. Anybody who want to follow up offline, please let me know. And thank you so much for your invitation. I enjoyed it. And sorry, I was a little bit low energy. I was a little bit sick today. But uh, uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. And hope you get better soon. <laughs> okay. See Bye. you. Bye.